Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. On behalf of the Saturday Night Live at Pine Lake Speaker Meeting, please help me welcome tonight's speaker, Chris C. from Portland. My name is Chris. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is February 5th, 1987, and uh, grateful to be here. Um, You know, I'm uh, grateful to participate in my own recovery. I don't know if anybody will get anything out of anything I have to share, but I know that when I come and share honestly and share a little bit about who I am and where, where I came from and a little bit of what I used to be like, what happened, what I'm like now, even if nobody else here gets anything out of it, I do. I get to continue to stay sober and get a little bit more of that fourth dimension. I get to go home and continue to live the way I'm living, which uh, I like. Funny thing about <clears throat> me is uh, I like who I am today, and I wouldn't trade per- places with anybody on this planet. And yet, before I came here, I would have traded places with anybody. So uh, I was introduced. I'm from Portland, but I actually live on the corner of North La Brea and Hollywood Boulevard in Los Angeles. So um, I'm kind of from Portland. Uh, I do. I'm originally from Portland, and I have an office in Portland, and I still maintain a residence in Portland. But I spend most of my time in Los Angeles these days, um, which is good. I mean, I need to get. I, I live in downtown Portland in a in a loft. And I'm in the epicenter. I don't know if you guys have been following the news out of there, but our protests are not protests. They're riots, and I'm right in the heart of it. I I need to get back to L.A. where it's safe. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, um, so uh, burn through the niceties. I want to thank Pixie for asking me to speak. And my understanding is she's not here tonight, right? Pixie's not here? That's a bad sign when the person that asked the speaker doesn't show up to uh, listen. So, you know, brace yourself. Um, anyway, no, but I do, I, I, I extend my, uh, my thanks out to her and anybody else who made this possible. Um, I do take this very seriously. I'm not, a, I'm not a speaker per se, even though I do speak at conferences and at groups. Um, I'm an AA member, and I hope that I can reflect that, you know. Uh, there's, I would much rather be somebody that's known as a good walker of the walk than a very articulate communicator that can get up to a podium and, you know, and entertain you. There's some people in AA and, uh, that apparently think that they're supposed to come up here and be comedians and be entertainers. I'm not one of them. So anyway, with that, a uh, little bit of what I used to be like, what happened and what I'm like now. I drank for 11 years. And for whatever reason, in those 11 years, my alcoholism progressed very rapidly. In those 11 years, I was arrested 15 or 16 different times for alcohol-related offenses. I had three DUIs. I ended up in a couple different treatment centers. I ended up in hospitals as a result of alcohol withdrawal. Um, I uh, was somebody that started off as a daily, uh, daily drinker and progressed to a daily oblivion drinker. And... Just to give you a little bit of an idea where my mind can still go sometimes today, uh, although this was probably 10 years ago now, I was asked to speak at a meeting, and um, before I came up to speak, I was sitting there thinking, how will I start off? And I thought, well, I'll just kind of go through my the consequences, my laundry list of highlights or lowlights, so to speak. So I was kind of like, okay, 15 to 16 alcohol-related rests, three DUIs, couldn't hold a job, daily oblivion drinking, you know, habitual bedwetter, uh, silver. And I just went right through this list. And when I got done, at the very end, very quietly out of nowhere, my mind said, you know, maybe you're not really an alcoholic after all. (laughs) Now, I recoiled from that thought as if from a hot flame. However, I got to tell you that that is the exact thought that used to take me to my next drink. You know, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, They told me, they said, it's the first drink that gets you drunk. And I know what they meant by that. You know, that once I ingest alcohol, I have a, you know, I have a reaction and I lose control. But that's not the whole story with me. It wasn't the first drink that got me drunk. 
it was something that happened up here in my mind that convinced me that I could take that first drink safely this time. You know, the book describes it as the subtle insanity that precedes the first drink. And they talk about this mental blank spot, you know, uh, and, and that's what I had. I had this mind that despite the consequences, despite the pitiful and incomprehensible, demoralizing things I did, despite the fact that it was somebody that ended up getting the DTs when I'd come off of alcohol and would have to be medically uh, detox to come off of alcohol, despite the jail, despite the burning my life to the ground, in every way, my mind would say, hey, maybe if I uh, drink this way tonight, I'll be okay. And the insanity is, is I bought that hook, line, and sinker every time, and that took me to my first drink. And then the phenomenon of craving and all that took off, and I drank uncontrollably and so forth. And I tried everything. I tried, I, I mean, that, the, and the funny thing about the insanity that, that precedes the first drink with me is at the time it doesn't seem insane. It seems like, of course, how come I've never thought about that before? If I only drink this way, it's okay. It only seems insane if I'm sober in Alcoholics Anonymous and I've applied the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous to my mind and I look back in hindsight and think, how could have I thought that? That's, you know, that's an insane thought. But in the middle of an untreated mind, it doesn't seem insane. It, uh, I can't see it. Even though everybody here could see it from the outside, I can't see it when I'm in the middle of it. It seems like the way it is. You know, uh, one, of my, one of my nights that I recall was, um, I, you know, I came to in the morning and, uh, you know, I swore off drinking only to a few hours to have that insanity slip into my mind. And it said, you know, maybe if I drink a glass of water in between each drink tonight, then I'll be okay. And I was like, of course. How come I've never thought about that? Pace myself. Drink a glass of water in between each drink. And the only thing that that did differently than any other night is I wet the bed earlier in the evening than I normally did. <laughs> so, anyway, when I was, uh, when I was not drinking, <clears throat> I was somebody that, well, the book describes it as being restless, irritable, and discontent. That's like a colossal understatement with me. I felt like I was on the brink of insanity when I wasn't drinking. Uh, I was, I, I had this great sense of being different than other people. I had this sense of alienation, this sense of not being enough, this sense of not, of, of less than and not a part of. I had, um, you know, Bill Wilson in his story, not the story in the book, but in his story and other places, he talks about it seemed as though there was a strange barrier between him and other people, and he could just never cross over that threshold. That's the way it was with me. It seemed like there was everybody in the world and then me, and this barrier between me and them, and I could never cross over and participate in life the way they were. I was somebody that had battled with, battles with dark depressions when there was no catalyst for a depression. I just would go and slip into this depression, I was somebody that when I wasn't drinking, I had, uh, I had, I had a lot of fear, and I had a lot of irrational fears. Um, I had a lot of anxiety. It seemed like I just, I lived at a constant state of low-grade anxiety, peppered with just sheer terror at times, over nothing. Oh, you know, over absolutely nothing. And alcohol fixed that. My magic number was 8 to 12, or 8 to 12, 8 to 10 drinks. 8 to 10 drinks. When I would ingest, when I'd get up into a few drinks, my shoulders would come down. This mind that was on me would slow down to what seemed to be a normal pace. I could take a deep breath, and I felt okay. 8 to 10 drinks made me feel the way that you people, well, not you people, <laughs> Eight to ten drinks made me feel the way those people out there felt normally. Eight to ten drinks allowed me to come out and participate in, in life in a way that I was never able to participate without that alcohol. So alcohol was absolutely not my problem. Alcohol was my solution. I loved it. It worked. 
And uh, so I drank it right from the beginning. I loved it. I loved everything about it. And I had consequences right from the beginning. But the consequences, the benefit of drinking outweighed the consequences that, uh, that I suffered as a result of drinking. And so I drank all the time, and I absolutely loved it. So anyway, fast-forwarding through my story, I got into trouble early on. I wrecked. I was a runaway as a young kid. I grew up in Portland. Um, I grew up in kind of a uh, upper-middle-class neighborhood. I went to private schools, and I ran away from home. You know, there's no reason for me being an alcoholic genetically. There's a lot of reasons, you know, but no, no uh, environmental reasons as far as I know. Um, but... Um, you know, so I, I just I just had a, an affinity for alcohol and the effects that it produced. I ran away from home. I was kicked out of high school. I was uh, I immediately started having problems with the law. And when I say problems with the law, I don't mean thievery or anything like that. You know, there's it's it's kind of hip in AA sometimes to say I'm a lighter cheater, cheater and a thief. Not me. I never was a thief. I mean, I just, it, I wasn't. Uh, you know, my, my arrests had to do with like assaulting bartenders, drunk driving, public drunkenness, things like that. Not, uh, not criminal behavior, not real criminal behavior. Um, uh, anyway, um, so I had problems and just fast forwarding, I'm going to go right up to the last year and a half of my drinking, the fall of, so, Upper middle class neighborhood in, Por in Portland. When I got out of high school, I became a logger. I moved, uh, you know, 150 miles, became a logger. I set chokers. I pulled rigging. I became a hook tender. I went to Alaska and logged. And uh, I did that. And I, you know, I drank in, you know, amongst the professionals. These guys knew how to drink. And me as a, as a young guy, 18, 19 years old, was, uh, you know, stood out amongst the professionals as a, as a, as a drinker. Uh, fall of 1985, um, I was living in southern Oregon on the California border in Ashland, Oregon, and I was walking down the street, and I was, I was thinking about my life and where I was. And where I was was I had been for several years now been battling trying to control and enjoy my drinking or either all, stop altogether on my own. And, um, and I was a wreck of a human being. And I remember thinking to myself and saying to myself, it's just like, I, I can't sink any lower than I am. I, I am beaten. I have lost at life. I, I just, it, my life was over at this time in the fall of 1985. And I thought about my drinking, and because I knew I had a drinking problem. I knew it was evident. But, you know, my mantra was, I had a drinking problem. I got it. But when I wasn't drinking, I felt so uncomfortable in my own skin that I thought I had something else wrong with me. I know my mantra was there's something really wrong with me. You know, they they talked about um, this sense of impending doom when I came here. My sense of impending doom had progressed to this sense of impending insanity. I questioned my sanity on a constant basis. I thought I was. I just felt like I was on the edge all the time when I didn't wasn't drinking. And I've heard said I don't know if this is true, but I've heard said that in some alcoholics that actually drinking can actually preserve some alcoholic sanity, that without alcohol and without some sort of substitute, that they can actually snap. And I have no idea if that's true or not, but it's certainly the way I felt. Anyway, so I was walking along, having this conversation with myself, and it's like, I'm tired of fighting this thing. I, you know, I've made plan after plan to either try to slow it down or to stop. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And so I made the decision to just accept who I was for who I, who I was. And that was, I'm a drinker. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drink whenever I feel like drinking, and I'm going to drink however much I drink, I'm going to drink. No longer am I going to put together these plans on how to do it successfully, try to pull it back, you know, all this stuff. And what, what, what it was in, in some... Uh, in some weird way, it was, it was a surrender. I mean, I just essentially just surrendered to alcohol. And so for the next three weeks, I drank to unconsciousness or blackout every day. And at the end of the three weeks, I thought, oh, my God, am I going to be ever be able to make this stop? And it was instantly replaced with the second thought. And the second thought was, I don't care, because this is the happiest I've ever been in my life. 
because there was a freedom in that type of drinking that I hadn't experienced before. Before that three-week period, I had tried to look like those people. I tried to act like those people. I tried to do ordinary, responsible things, like have a driver's license, have a car, hold a job, pay bills, and so forth. And in, in that three-week period, what I did is I gave up at life, and I surrendered my life to alcohol, and it was the best I'd ever felt. You know, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, I used to think, I, I, you know, I, I like well, some of us anyway, I had a lot of judgments of uh, other people in AA, and uh, one of the judgments was, is I sat in rooms of AA, and it was just like, you got a job, what are you doing here? You know, you have a driver's license. Why would you come to AA? You have a wife. Why would you, why would you, you know, why would you come? You've never had the DTs. You've never had to spend six days on Librium to not go into convulsions and hallucinate from alcohol withdrawal. You're a drug addict. Why, why would you even come to Alcoholics Anonymous? And because I judge people that were functioning alcoholics. And what I found is that 90% of the people that die from alcoholism are functioning alcoholics. They're not alcoholics like me. They're the people that are paying their bills, that are going to work every day. And it was only a couple years later that I, I heard a story in AA about a guy who was an attorney. And he talked about every day getting up in the morning sick grinding it out till noon, and at noon, racing over and taking a few couple belts just to take the edge off, and then grinding it out throughout the afternoon, and then started, and then drinking in the evening, and he did it day after day after day after day, this whole time holding up this image of that he is a responsible citizen, and I was like, oh my God, I have it completely wrong. Those people, that kind of alcoholic has it so much harder than me because I gave up. I looked like an alcoholic. I, I didn't do, I didn't, I didn't work from that day forward until I got sober except for little tiny pieces of time. I gave up. And there's a, there's a freedom in that. Anyway, not to get off on that crap. Um, so anyway, uh, and so what happened is there was freedom and I started to drink. I became a daily oblivion drinker. And that, uh, you know, I've heard said that alcoholism is the only progressive disease that has a fun face. And that was, that was my fun phase. But it was, it was short-lived. Soon after that, the problem started stacking up again. And one more time, I'm fighting alcohol. And my, my days became like Groundhog Day. Every morning I'd come to, I'd be sick. And, uh, I mean, just horribly sick from the night before. I would, uh, I would have the shakes in the morning, and I would have, you know, I couldn't determine, I never was able to determine between hot and cold, because I had, I would be sweating, freezing, and I'd have these internal tremors in the morning where I'd go like this, and I'd shake, and I would just be so full of shame and guilt and remorse, regardless of what I did the night before. I might have done some despicable things the night before, or I may, may not have. It didn't matter. It was irrelevant. It was shame, guilt, and remorse were my constant companions when I came to in the morning. And then I'd sit there and wade through that sickness in the morning, and then I would come up with the resolve. Today's it. Today's going to be different. I'm done. I'm not drinking. That's it. It's killing me. I'm changing my, you know, changing my life going forward. And that'd last about maybe one, two, three hours. And then somewhere after time period, something would slip in my head and it would say, hey, maybe if tonight, if you only, you know, if you only drink beer or if you only, you know, you know stay away from uh, gin. Gin makes you violent. You know, drink something besides gin, then you'd be okay. And I would go, that's it. And bam, I did it. And I did it day in and day out, day in and day out. June of 1986, I wound up in a um, medical detox that was attached to a 28-day inpatient treatment center. I did uh, I did the uh, inpatient or did the detox, and and I'll tell you just to give you a, an idea of how sick my mind was. Um, I went in there because I was going through the DTs, and most alcoholics that come to Alcoholics Anonymous don't have the DTs. I mean, yeah, there it's it's not a some alcoholics, a minority of alcoholics get DTs. Most alcoholics don't. So if you're new, don't worry if you didn't have them. You missed out, but you didn't. Uh, anyway, um, I, was, I tried to wean myself off of alcohol. And on the third day of weaning myself off, I started hallucinating. And um, the hallucination I saw was a rodent attacking me in the bed. 
And uh, so I checked into a detox. They pumped me full of Librium. I stayed for five days on the Librium. That's after three days of detoxing myself. And I'm laying there in my little detox robe and detox slippers. And there was guys that were significantly older than me and had been drinking a lot longer than me that would come into this detox, you know, and they were in their 60s or 70s. They'd see snakes coming out of the wall. They'd be there for like two days, and then they'd eject them into the population. And I'd be like, why are they holding me in this detox? These guys, they're ejecting. And then it hit me. They're trying to make me think that I'm a worse alcoholic than I actually am. So they're purposely holding me in detox longer. And I bought it. And the other thing I bought as I was sitting there uh, going through uh, withdrawal is I thought about being attacked by the rodents in uh, my bed. And I thought, you know, did I really have that hallucination? Or was I so concerned about going into the DTs that what actually happened is I drifted off to sleep and had a dream that I was being attacked by rodents, and I didn't actually hallucinate. It was just a dream. And I, I, so maybe I'm not as bad as I think I am, you know, because normal drinkers try to determine whether they are dreaming about DTs or actually experiencing DTs. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was introduced to Narcotics Anonymous, and uh, I was introduced to the steps and nutrition and physical exercise and all sorts of stuff in this treatment center. I got out of there, and uh, and I drank. I think it was like two weeks after I got out of there, and uh, you know I was drinking again, and um. I was going to think about telling one story, but I'm not going to for the sake of time because I, I always end up going too long on this one area. Anyway, so anyway, day after day, the same thing. And this entered into probably the darkest, most despairing time of my life. And that was about the last 10 months of my drinking. In the last 10 months of my drinking, I was living on a daily basis, trying every fiber in me to not drink and drink into oblivion every day. There was no fun left. It, that had been gone a long time, and I'd very, I had, had very little anyway uh, prior to that um, for quite a while. And uh, it was so dark. And one of the things, when I look back at my drinking, I think, you know, the drinking almost killed me. But also when I look back, I think it seems as though that I almost died of loneliness. I experienced a loneliness when I was drinking that I have difficulties articulating. It was such an empty, hollow, soul-sickening loneliness. And the thing about it that was odd is it was at its worst when I was around other people. And it was even more potent if those people happened to be family members. And I mean, it was just, and so I was living this just desperate life trying not to drink, reading all this crap on self-help on how not to drink, you know, reading everything I could find uh, on it. And, uh, and so in um, October of 1986, I came across, or late September, I guess, it was, I came across a, uh, an ad in the newspaper for uh, a dry logging camp up outside of Ketchikan, Alaska. They were looking for loggers to go work on this island where there was no alcohol allowed. And I thought, that's it. You know, I'll go up, uh, I'll go up, take a job on this island and, you know, dry out and put this whole alcoholism thing behind me and, you know, leave Alaska a new guy. And so I went up to, uh, I went up there and drank all the way up, drank uh, in Ketchikan, went out to camp, went to work and, uh, Three weeks into working there, it was a, it was a floating camp you know, on this island. It was an hour and a half float plane ride out of Ketchikan. And we, were, we had bunk houses, and, and the, there was a community room in the bunk house, and then like four uh, like bedrooms off of the, the community room. And I was in the community room watching the World Series, uh, minding my own business, when two guys came into camp who smuggled a bottle of whiskey into our community room. And uh, they cracked the, the, the lid, and they said, you know, each took kind of a belt off of it, and they said, do you want a drink? 
And my mind, I mean, the whole reason I'm up there is to get over this alcoholism thing. But my mind said very quickly, it's like, you know, I've been here for three weeks. And I even 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 thought about alcohol. I haven't craved alcohol. I didn't go through the DTs this time. You know, maybe I'm overreacting. Maybe I'm not really an alcoholic after all. Sure, I'll have a drink. And um, they handed me this bottle. And I took the bottle. And I tipped it up. And I went, gunk, gunk, gunk. And one of the loggers grabbed it and, from me and yanked it from me and said, hey, we got to make this last. And I had thought we had cracked the seal and the three of us were going to split the bottle. They had brought a bottle of whiskey to like take a shot off of each night when they got home from work. So what happened to me is I had the equivalent of about two straight shots of whiskey in me and absolutely no way to get a third drink. Zero way. And... You talk about the phenomenon of craving. I know more about the phenomenon of craving from having alcohol yanked away from me than drinking uncontrollably because it was as if every fiber, every cell in my entire body was screaming for more alcohol. I mean, I was, it it was like an itch that I couldn't scratch. I was dying from the inside out wanting more alcohol. And so I I laid down on my bunk and I laid through this craving and I finally drifted off to sleep. And I came to, or I I woke up, I wasn't drunk, so I I woke up the next morning, and I caught the the only float plane that came into camp, came in every 24 hours, caught it, went straight into Ketchikan. There was a tavern there called the Folksal Tavern, which was nicknamed the Folksal Snake Pit. It was a kind of a legendary bar back in those days where the loggers and the fishermen would all gather and and drink and fight and knife each other and stuff, and uh, it was like... I was determined to go drink at the forecastle. It was a bar where when you order a drink, if you ordered like a Jim Beam, they didn't give you a Jim Beam, a glass of Jim Beam. They gave you a bottle of Jim Beam with the glass on top. And uh, in this bar, it was like an old-fashioned bar, and uh, in one corner at the end, there was a stairwell that went up to a little loft. Up in the loft, there was like a half a dozen cots up there. So when these loggers would come out of the woods and drink, and pass out in the forecastle, they would drag them up the stairs, put them on a cot so they could sleep it off, and when they came to, they could come back downstairs and start drinking again. So my kind of place. And um, <laughs> anyway, I went into the forecastle. I, I don't, by this time, by the way, I used to have a huge tolerance for alcohol. I was able to drink a tremendous amount of alcohol, you know, 10, 11 drinks, and you could, you, you, people didn't, couldn't notice that I was drunk. I mean, I had a slight slur, and that was about it. But something had happened by now where it was really unpredictable. Sometimes my tolerance level was high. Other times, I'd slip into a blackout between, you know, maybe after three drinks. Blackout. So it was like some day, total oblivion after three or four drinks. Other times, I'd be at 14, and I could barely feel alcohol in my system. This was one of those nights I slipped into a blackout right off the bat. I had about three or four drinks in me, and the last thing I remember was this guy named Dan across the table looking at me saying, you think you're pretty badass, don't you? Then I went into a blackout. I came out of the blackout, and I was throwing punches, and people were punching me. Went back into the blackout, came out of the blackout on my hands and knees behind the folks while walking down the alley, and because it's so, I used to always tell a story as I think I was soliciting a prostitute, but when I think about it, it's like, I might have been talking to a garbage can. I have no idea what I was doing. I was just crawling down an alley. Uh, it just somehow seems like I was soliciting a prostitute, but it, it, it had no real recollection of anything. And anyway, I wound up in jail that night, and um, they threw me in a holding cell after beating me up because of, you know, because of the way I was, and it deservedly needed to be beat up, I should say. I ended up in the holding cell, and there was two other guys in the holding cell. There was a bunk bed and a single cot. I was in the lower cot, and there was a guy above me. And I laid there, and I slipped off into unconsciousness. And when I came to in the morning, the guy on the top bunk was hanging over the bunk, looking at me upside down. I looked up, and I said, can I help you? And um, and he said, my name is something, or rather, I've got 30 days sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm in jail here doing 10 days of jail times because my sponsor made me come and, came, come and make an amends to the community for the jail time I owe. And I looked at him, squinted through, you know, the sickness I had. I looked at him, and I was like, oh, my God, I can't even get away from these AA people in here. <laughs> but the truth is, is that was the beginning of a series of coincidences that led me to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I had a lot of, by the way, I've, had a, I've been to a lot of AA meetings by this time, and I 
did not want AA. It was not for me, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh, anyway, I went to, they processed me and let me go, and I, I came back down to uh, Oregon and um, worked for a couple days in Portland and, uh, you know, got drunk, lost that job, and uh, worked a couple days down in Eugene, lost that job, got drunk, lost that job, wound up down in Ashland, back into Ashland, and um, and I owed, January of 1987, I owed eight days of jail time for my third DUI. And I was doing the jail time on the weekend. So I would go in on Friday night, and they'd release me on Sunday. And so uh, anyway, and I because they thought I had a job during the weekdays, which I didn't by that time. But I went in on um, my, my third weekend. Between my third and my fourth weekend, I got arrested midweek for public drunkenness. And... Uh, and it, and it was just it was just one of these stupid things. We they used to make these suitcases full of Ham's beer. It wasn't a 24 pack. It was like maybe a 48 pack or something. But it was like a suitcase of Ham's. And there was myself and two other guys stumbling around downtown Ashland with our suitcase of Ham's. And it was sitting there, and we were sitting there drinking. And two cops showed up, and two guys ran. I reached for the suitcase and then ran, and so they caught me. And um, and anyway, they they arrested me. And and as they were lecturing me, they 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 knew who I was by this time. They said, you know, they said, Chris, they said you've got a hell of a drinking problem. You have got to do something about your drinking. And in trying to get out of the arrest, I was like, yeah, sure, uh, you know, I, I I know that I need to do something. And they said, go see this guy Joe F. Joe is an expert on alcoholism. And he can help you out. And I was like, okay, I'll go see this guy, Joe F. And uh, again, trying to get out of the arrest. Anyway, they processed me, and then they released me later in the evening. I went home, and either the following day or a couple days after that, I was walking down the street. And again, now I'm living my life desperately not wanting to drink. AA was not an answer for me, but I desperately didn't want to drink. And I was walking down the street. And there was one of these sidewalk preachers, you know, that stand on the corner with a Bible and just reads uh, passages as people come by. And I came walking past this guy, and he read something out of the Bible. And I have no idea what it was. But he read something, and when he said it, it somehow seemed to correlate with the cops telling me to go see this guy, Joe F. And I thought, you know, if I was one of those AA people, I would think, ooh, that's the hand of God and work in my life. And that's like an intuitive thought or inspiration. And I should actually go see this guy, Joe F. And I took a couple more steps. And then I had just a real brief moment of clarity. And the moment of clarity was this. And it said, what if for once in my life, I didn't dismiss that stuff as being trivial and stupid. And I actually acted on it, even though I don't believe it. And then I thought, what do I have to, you know, what do I have to lose? And I turned around and I started heading to this guy, Joe F's office. And I went up to Joe F's office and, um, and my plan was I was going to go to the Schick Center, 10 days, couple two day follow ups. That was my next, uh, treatment center. And I was waiting for Joe. His secretary went and said that I was here, that I was there for a drinking problem because I did. And I was, I was remember sitting there thinking, please not AA. Please tell me you went to Schick. You know, and you're sober like 10 years, and everything's wonderful. And uh, anyway, sure enough, he's a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I go in, he tells me a little bit of his story, and then invites me to a meeting. And he said, do you want to go? No, everything in me didn't want to go. I've been to AA. You know, I, I, don't, I didn't shoot heroin. I don't belong in AA. You know, I mean, that's not, that's not, my, that's not my story. I'm an alcoholic. And, um, and so... Uh, I didn't want to go, and but I there was I had this sense of obligation to go since I asked this guy for help, and I said, "Yeah, sure, I'll help." So he took me to the Clay Street meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous on Thursday night in Ashland, Oregon. I walked in; there was people there that greeted me. I went and I sat in the very back. It was a meeting of about 60, 70 people or so. Speaker participation, and um, and I, I say this, you know, the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous expelled the obsession to drink alcohol and changed me from the inside out. But the truth of the matter is that the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous actually saved my life. Because had the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous not existed, I never would have given God a chance. I never would have given that big book a chance. I certainly never would have stood in a circle with people and said the Lord's Prayer. 
or anything else. But because of the traditions, something happened to me that made it okay for me to do that. And what happened to me is this. I sat down there, and, and I, I knew I was an alcoholic, so I raised my hand and said, yes, I'm a newcomer. And what they did is they created an atmosphere of identification. Now, see, what happened to me is <clears throat> prior, because I'd been to about 30 AA meetings by this time, and every AA meeting that I'd been to prior to this time, there wasn't really any semblance of traditions. There was, there was no primary purpose in these meetings. There was no singleness of purpose in these meetings. And, you know, the thing is, is I have some experience with drugs in, in my story, but the thing about me is, as an alcoholic, alcohol got me there, and my life depended upon getting there. Drugs got me high, and they were fun, but they weren't, they weren't the lifesaver for me. I know they are for some people. Those people are called drug addicts. As an alcoholic, they were something I did, and I did abuse them at times. But alcohol was the thing that I, I, my life was contingent upon getting me, getting there. And alcohol got me there. And I'd been to these meetings where speakers would come up and they'd talk about, and particularly in Portland, you know, because of uh, just similar, I'm sure, to Seattle being port cities. And at the time in the, in the 80s, heroin was becoming very chic. And so it was very common in Portland for a speaker at an AA meeting to get up here and talk about, you know, slamming dope, ripping and running to Old Town, all the thievery they did to score their dope, this and that, and so forth. Fascinating stories, much more colorful than my story. But I could never bridge that gap. I could never identify with these people. There was a difference, because that wasn't me. I'm not a drug addict that happened to do some drinking. I'm an alcoholic that happened to do some drugs. So I never identified this meeting, however, and by the way, I'm not making some pitch on what should and shouldn't happen in AA. I'm just saying what happened to me. I happen to be a believer in singleness of purpose, and I don't believe that singleness of purpose is about keeping anybody out of AA. I think singleness of purpose is about keeping the alcoholics in AA, and it's, and it's saved my life. So anyway, what happened to me is I sat down, and the speaker got up there, and she shared a little bit of what she used to be like, what happened, what she's like now, and then each participant, they would sit, they would stand at their seat and give a little pitch, and each, uh, each participant did that. And it was the first time I'd ever heard people like, share like this in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what happened was the magic of identification. Somewhere in the middle of these shares, I started nodding. And, and little by little, I was identifying. And there was this guy named Frank who stood up and he shared about coming out of a blackout, holding a revolver in his mouth, and then going back into the blackout and coming to, uh, with the, on the floor with the revolver next to him. And, um, that gave me goosebumps when he said that because I had almost an identical experience and I'd never told anybody because I was certain I was the only person that wasn't institutionalized that did things like this. I'd come out of a blackout one night and I was holding a carving knife to myself. I went back into the blackout and I came to the next morning on the floor with the knife next to me. The only difference between Frank's story and my story is in my blackout, I also somewhere in the middle of the night knifed to death all the furniture in the house and broke every dish in the house. And, uh, I was a guest in these people's house. and um, <clears throat> So anyway, when he said that, it gave me goosebumps because I thought I was the only person that did these types of things. And so anyway, the long and short of it is this, is that meeting, because of the traditions, there was no implied affiliation with anybody else. No, like we, we just came out of a real tumultuous and political environment. Thank God when I didn't go in there, they weren't all one political party or another political, or have stickers of candidates, because I would have looked at it and said, oh, they're all those kind of people. Not for me. You know, there was, there was not, it was in the unity and et cetera. And what happened is through that, they, they did. They created an atmosphere of identification where a guy like me could come sit in the back and little by little recognize that this was a room full of people that drank the way I drank, felt the way I felt, and thought the way I thought, and they were staying sober. And it gave me the first time in my life I had just a morsel of hope. Maybe this will work for me. The next day, I didn't take a drink. I didn't do anything in AA, but I didn't take a drink because I had this little bit of hope. The following day after that, I drank, and I drank for one more week. February 4th, 1987, <clears throat> I went out one more time to try to beat the game, as they say. And my plan that night was 
I'm going to drink 10 drinks, and then I'm going to shut it down by 10 or 11 o'clock at the latest, come home, go to bed, get a good night's sleep, and wake up and be like a regular person. The, my, my lower companion was coming to pick me up to take us down to the bars, and I bought a 12-pack of beer for us to drink in the car on the way down to the bars. And he was running late, and I drank nine of them waiting for him to come pick me up to go drink my 10. So uh, I pretty much blew my plan before I even left the house. But um, went down, I drank at these bars. I remember I was drinking vodka Collins at this one bar. I had one hand over one eye to keep from seeing double. Then I ended up at my favorite drinking establishment, Cook's Tavern in Ashland, Oregon. Little interesting side note. February 4th, 1987 is the last night I had a drink. But also, it's the very last night I've ever eaten a pickled egg. I haven't eaten a pickled egg in my entire sobriety. Because I think you have to have about 10 beers in you to reach into a jar of green juice and take one of those floating eggs who, who knows how long they've been floating around in there. But that was part of my diet back then. Anyway... Um, so I went down to Cook's Tavern. I started drinking there, and the bartender cut me off. I assaulted the bartender. Police were called. I started running through people's backyards, and police were you know, following, trying to pin me between people's yards. They finally did. I was arrested one more time. No different than many nights before, except something inside of me broke. And I have no way to explain that. I don't know what happened. All I know is I was standing there, and... I could just feel something happened in me, and I just, I gave up, and they cuffed me, they put me in the back of the car, and I, I wept in the back of the car, which before I generally would spew, you know, obscenities at the police and fight and so forth, and I just sat there and I wept. They processed me. I wept through the processing. They took me home at the end of the processing, dropped me off, and my last conscious thought that night as I laid there was something's different about tonight. I don't know what it is. I wonder if I'll feel this way in the morning. And it was different in the morning. February 5th, 1987, I, I, I came to, and I was completely beaten by alcohol. I had no more fight left in me. Everything in me was broken and damaged and completely defeated. You know, and I wasn't afraid of dying. Uh, you know, if I had a crystal ball that morning that I could have looked into and it, and it said, look, if you just drink for another six months, you'll be dead, I would have drank myself to death. Or if you drink for another, you just keep drinking for another year, you'll be dead, I would have drank myself to death. What I was terrified of is, is that I was going to keep living. I was going to keep living this way, drinking the way I'm drinking, and I was going to live for another two years or another five years or another ten years and continuing to spiral further and further down this miserable existence of a life I was living. And in that desperation, in that complete uh, defeat, I cried out to a God that I didn't believe in, and I said, God, please make this stop or kill me. And then I said the Lord's Prayer. And I didn't know this at the time. I only know this in hindsight. But the obsession to drink alcohol was removed that morning. February 4th of 1987, I lived with an obsession to drink alcohol every day. And on February 5th of 1987, it was removed and it's never come back. And I, I attribute that to a couple things. One is starting with that surrender that morning and reaching out to that God, even though I didn't believe in that God. And two, by all of the actions I've taken in Alcoholics Anonymous since then, even though at a lot of the times in the beginning, and even sometimes today, they seem to have no relevance to what my problems are. And so I didn't pray for willingness or any of that. It just was there. And because of that one Alcoholics Anonymous meeting that I'd been to where there was a primary purpose in place, I knew there was a place like me where people that drank like me were staying sober. And I checked myself into Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started doing the things that they started doing. Went to 90 meetings in 90 days. I started reading the big book. I got a sponsor. Started working the steps. I started praying to a God I didn't believe in. And uh, when I was new, you know, they were, they were very adamant. They said, they, were, they pointed the chapter, We Agnostics, where it says, it says, just a willingness to believe is enough to make a start. You don't have, you know, that's all you have to do. And, you know, a lot of people would say, fake it till you make it. And one guy put it in a way that I really liked. He said, you don't have to believe in God to make a start in this program. You just have to take actions as if you believe in God. And I thought, that I can do. I can take actions as if I believe in God, even though I don't. 
And so I started doing that. And one day after another, I was continuing to stay sober. And, um, and soon after that, things started, my life started falling into place. All my life, I seemed to be like a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. And it was starting to, and for once, it, I wasn't that way. It was actually working. And uh, I came across that line in the big book where it says, our ideas did not work, but the God idea did. And when I saw that, I was like, yeah, it's exactly where I'm at. My ideas never worked, but the God idea is working. I'm not sure if I believe in God, but it's working. And so through that, that, that just that little bit of effort to act as if, I came to believe in a power greater than myself. Not because I wanted to believe, but because the evidence started stacking up that something was at work much larger than me in my life. So anyway, fast forwarding, I did steps one, two, and three, and, uh, and my life was, for the first time ever, I was living a life. But I stopped. I didn't go on into my four-step. And uh, even though my sponsor and everybody in the group kept saying, get your four-step done, get your four-step done, get your four-step done. And so somewhere around six or seven months, and by the way, just for the new people, I just want you to know, I wasn't somebody who came into AA and said, oh, my God, I'm home. You know, this is it. I, I love these people. I hated these people. <laughs> hated them. But it was working, so I kept going. And I hated the stupid stuff. Keep coming back. I mean, it's just, but. And I, and I grew up in a religion and, and where I just found the Lord's Prayer so offensive. And, but you know what? The people that were staying sober were saying the Lord's Prayer. And they were saying, keep coming back. Yeah, it works. So I did as they did. I didn't have any fight left in me. And, um, and anyway, uh, my first year was tough. I, I felt like I was, I was plagued with so much anxiety and depression, and I was up and down, and I thought I was going insane half the time. And I, I mean, just, you know, I, I was 44 days sober. I ended up in the emergency room from an anxiety attack because I thought I was having a heart attack. You know, and so it, was, it wasn't easy. I didn't coast into it, but I just kept pushing forward. Anyway, by the time I got to be about nine months sober, I was just coming apart. What once was good in the foundation I built through those first three steps and the actions I took was dissipating, and little by little I was becoming tighter and tighter, and the anxiety and the depression and everything, and I'm just, I'm just going berserk in sobriety. And, um, and just, I'll give you an idea of, of where I was. I, I entered in college by this time, uh, back, went back to college at, by this time, and I was taking a handful of classes, and one of the classes I was taking was a psychology class, and it was a, it was a large auditorium class, large being like about this size, and we, one day, we were studying stress and the effects of stress, and the professor had us do this this test, and we, we all took this test. It was kind of like a mini version of the uh, MMPI. And uh, so I took this test, and I answered everything honestly because I'm now in AA and I'm being honest. And I, I take these, and then we self-graded. And so I sat there, and I self-graded my test. And after the class, the professor says, who here in this class scored between 0 and 25? And there was like two people in the class. And he said, you people have literally zero stress or you process stress so well that, you know, it's, you, it does, it's like water off a duck's back, is what he said. Who here scored between 25 and uh, 50? Almost the entire class. He said, you people don't have any major stressors in your life and you process stress in an average fashion. This is, you know, this is the average. Who here scored between 50 and 75? There was maybe 10% of the class that raised their hand. And uh, he said, you people have a, you know, either you're just not very good at processing stress or you have a certain level of uh, stress in your life that's affecting you, maybe some minor stressors. Who here scored between 75 and 100? And there was like two or three people that raised their hand. And he said, you people have a significant stressor in your life death of a loved one, loss of a job, financial, uh, you know, ruin, you know, something like that, a divorce, so, something significant. Who here scored between 100 and 125? Nobody. Anybody with uh, over 125? Nobody. And he said, I didn't think anybody in this classroom would score over 125 because generally people that score over 125 
are either locked up in federal penitentiaries or institutionalized. Now, I scored 146. I just, I just wasn't going to raise my hand and be the only one. And, um, and so he, he just confirmed what I knew all along. Yes, I'm an alcoholic, but I'm also completely insane. And I just was proven in a psychology class. So as soon as the class was over, I went down to see the uh, professor who happened to be three and a half years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, and he was in my home group. And I went up to him and I said, doctor, I said, I scored 146. And, uh, and he said, Chris, he goes, look, anybody, anybody in their first year would score over 125 on this test. He goes, That's, he goes you're suffering from untreated alcoholism. Do your fourth step. And, um, <laughs> and I walked away from that meeting thinking about that, and I thought, no, that can't be it. <laughs> but driven by pain a few weeks later, um, I out of just pure terror that I was going to drink again or go insane, I started writing my four step and I wrote my inventory. And my inventory, it, you know, it's really hip in some parts of the country today. I don't know if it happens up here, but there's like these, and I'm a big book guy, by the way. I mean, my, my sobriety is based out of the first 164 pages of the big book. That's the way I did the steps and so forth. But there's a contingency within Alcoholics Anonymous now that has taken the design for living out of the big book and made it almost like fundamentalism. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, like they, they only write their inventories in black and white because it says we put it down in black and white. And if you do it in blue, it's wrong. And, um, and when they do steps uh, six and seven, they say, we took this book down from a shelf. So they all go put a book on the shelf so they can actually take it down. Anyway, not knocking their programs. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of coming close, but I'm not knocking them. Um, but the, uh, anyway, I wrote an inventory, and to this date in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, I'm just a couple months shy of 30 years of sobriety. I've written a lot of inventories, and I've done some really good inventories with the columns, you know, and, and the right terms and everything. This inventory was not one of them. This inventory was a mess. I don't know how many columns. There might have been seven columns in this inventory. And it was just page after page of garbage. And, it, I mean, to date, it was the most disorganized, sloppy inventory I've ever written. But I'm here to say, to date, it's the single best thing I've ever written in my entire life because I did it completely from the heart and not from a book trying to get it right. And I, I wrote this thing out of desperation. I got together with my sponsor, and I read it. And, um, and after we did it, before he gave me the instructions to go do step six and seven, we took a break, and I went into the restroom uh, on our break. And one of the things that I was in the habit of doing at this time is whenever I was in front of a uh, reflective surface is... Um, is uh, uh, um, I'd get trapped in it, and um, and I'd look at myself, and and I would wait for this reaction. And this reaction was not like an intellectual process; it was like a soul type of process. And what the process was was I'd stand there and look at myself in the mirror, and I'd tear myself down, and I'd beat myself up. You know, this is what's wrong with me. This is what's wrong with me. God, this is what's wrong with me. Get out, I mean, look at you know this, and on and on and on. Sometimes I would have a response where I'd look in the mirror and I'd have just a flash of like false bravado and I'd be like, this is what's right with me. This is what's right with me. And it was short lived because soon during that laundry list, I'd go right sinking back down and be like, no, God, I am just, it's not that way. And uh, anyway, I did my fist up. We took a break. I went to the restroom. I went to the mirror, and I waited for the reaction that I got every time I looked in that mirror. And I stood there looking at myself in the eyes, and it didn't come. And then a different sensation came, and I couldn't identify what the sensation was. And I looked, and I looked, and I was like, what is this I'm feeling? What is this? And then it hit me. It was comfort. I felt comfortable. And that doesn't, may not seem like a big deal, but it was a big deal to me because it was the first time I'd ever felt comfortable in my own skin without a certain amount of alcohol in my system. 
And I walked out of that restroom, got my sixth and seventh instructions, went and did it, and I became a believer in Alcoholics Anonymous as a design for living because what happened to me somewhere between steps four and step seven, trying to avoid insanity and a drink somewhere and taking these actions with just a shred of hope that they might work, I shifted on the inside, and I've never been the same person since, and I never anticipated it. There's a, on page 75 in the book, between five and six, it talks about some of these things. Uh, you know, it's some promises, similar to the promises that were read uh, at the beginning of the meeting. I didn't even know that was in the book. I came to that later, and I was like, that's almost exactly what happened to me. Something shifted in me, and I've never been the same human being since. I believed in Alcoholics Anonymous in terms of expelling the obsession to drink alcohol up to that point, but this is where I became a believer in Alcoholics Anonymous and as a design for living. And anyway, going forward, um, it was easy for me to do steps eight and nine by that time. Steps that I dreaded prior to this, now I, and I was looking forward to because I got so much juice out of, out of taking the steps. They changed my life. I was somebody, I should tell you, that... When I was not drinking, I couldn't look people in the eyes. In fact, if I was walking down the street, I had such terror, so, so much fear of people. If I was walking down the sidewalk and there was somebody coming the other way, I'd cross the street and go down the other side just to avoid eye contact with another human being. You know, unless I had 10 drinks in me, that's a different story. But if I wasn't drinking, I couldn't do it. And, uh, and I changed. And uh, so I went through the steps. And I'm just going to kind of fast forward since uh, I've... Uh, I'm starting to get to, towards the end here. Uh, my life changed, and at two and a half years sober, um, I got sober in a group that was really emphasized the big book, and it really emphasized uh, reliance on a higher power. And not only just reliance, but, but direction from that higher power. And it was, we were, they were really big on not talking the talk, but walking the walk, and really living a God-directed life. And so I had a lot of instruction from my sponsor in the group about living a God-directed life. Uncommon sense would become common sense. We developed this vital sixth sense, that that's where all this was at. And I started living that way. And um, about two and a half years sober, I dropped out of college, uh, you know, and I dropped out of college. It just wasn't for me. And, um, um, but I had a little bit of a knack for economics and finance. And uh, at two and a half years sober, I was meditating one day, and I had like this kind of baseball fantasy type thing, and I, I recognized that m my life was like me uh, stepping into the batter's box. All my life, I've been afraid to step into the batter's box and swing for fear that I would strike out and I'd look stupid and I would fail. So I wouldn't participate. I would never step into the batter's box of life. And this is kind of the fantasy that was going on during this meditation. And I, 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 and I then had this thought. I was like, we judge success by, you know, a single, a double, a triple, a home run, you know, uh, runs batted in, so forth. And then I thought, that's how they judge success in the real world. But the real world gets me drunk. I have to live in the realm of the spirit. And then I thought, success for me is not defined by whether I hit a home run or I strike out. Success for me is defined by stepping into the batter's box, tethered to God and doing the very best I can, and leaving the outcome to God. The only failure I can have is not stepping into the batter's box in the first place. The moment I step into the batter's box and swing, that's success. I use, and this was the analogy I'll just tell you, my dad played pro football and pro baseball. My brother played major league baseball, and I got drunk and went to jail a lot. So, I, But I still have baseball analogies. Anyway, so I recognized I lived my life that way, and I came out of there, and, and from there I used that as an intuitive thought or inspiration and took actions on it. And the funny thing about intuitive thoughts and inspiration is they never have a neon sign saying, this is an intuitive thought from God, you better do it. It's like this very subtle thought, and I think, is that like an intuitive thought? And then I think, no. No, it's not. That's, I'm just manufacturing that so I can go talk about it at an AA meeting and sound cool, you know, or something like that. And so what I've had to do is I've had to get out of, 
when I have what seems to be an intuitive thought, I have to act on it regardless of what the other voices in my mind say. And I did. So I hustled a job as a stockbroker. I became a stockbroker as somebody that couldn't look people in the eyes, who, you know, drank and went to jail. And, uh, and not that AA is about becoming, you know, successful or anything like that, but AA is a platform where I believe we can go out and live our lives in any way we want, provided we're following a spiritual life. At two and a half years sober, I became a stockbroker. At five years sober, I started my first firm. And, uh, and I, by the way, I hated being a stockbroker. I only did it because I owed financial amends. And I heard Chuck Chamberlain say, I'm just going to go in every day to rub out a record. And once that, rub, that record's uh, rubbed out, I'm out of here. And I did that because the stockbroker was the most efficient way for me to pay back my amends. And I did that. I'm here to rub out a record every day, a job I hated. Then two and a half years later, after I started that job, I started my first firm. I was starting to kind of like it. Then I ran that firm. I was CEO of that firm for about 18 years. I started a fund family, a second firm. And I now started, I have, I, I'm the chairman of the board of a national investment, boutique investment bank that myself and two partners started. And I'll tell you how that came about uh, because it was all God-based as well. And... Um, through intuitive thoughts, and so in acting on God reliance, I married the girl I always wanted to marry at five years sober. Well, she's uh, 23 years sober uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous today, and uh, or no, we've been married 23. Well, whatever. She's been sober a while, and we've been married a while. Um, anyway, uh, in the mid 20s, and um, and uh, and it, it had nothing to do with me. I just took footwork, and my life has been that way. I'm here to report that when I've acted on an intuitive thought, regardless of how goofy it may seem, uncommon sense becomes common sense, so far to date, I'm batting a 1,000%. And I want to share this. In 2010, 2012, um, I was working in San Francisco, and I was shutting down the office I was working in, and I was looking to start a firm. My two partners are in New York. I'm in San Francisco, but I decided I'm going to start the firm in Los Angeles. My little brother, who has played Major League Baseball, was going through a brutal divorce. He had a prenup in place, but his ex, uh, the attorneys found a way to puncture his prenup, and he was in great financial risk and financial ruin, possibly. I had spent the month of December up in Bend, Oregon, where he lived, helping him. Now I'm back in San Francisco. I sent my wife down to Los Angeles to find a place to live a few weeks earlier. I'm on my way down there because my two partners and I are going to start this investment bank. I pack up my office in San Francisco, and I start heading down the 101, and I get to San Jose. Between San Francisco and San Jose, 60 miles away, I'm having intuitive thought after intuitive thought of go to Bend and help your brother. Go to Bend and help your brother. And I'm saying, I already did. I already was there for a month. Yeah, he's an adult. You know, he's, I'm not a codependent. You know, I've, I've already been there. Go help your brother. Go help your brother. By the time I get to San Jose, I'm just like, okay. So I call my wife and I said, hey, I'm going to Bend. I don't know how long it's going to be. Pack the stuff up and come to Bend. So we go up to Bend and I spend the next five months. Now, again, I'm in the process of starting an investment bank, and I'm either going to look to buy an empty shell of an investment bank or start one from scratch through the regulatory process. And for those of you that don't know a lot about investment banking, I just want to tell you that Bend, Oregon is not exactly the investment banking center of the United States. <laughs> for that matter, Portland and Seattle aren't either, but Bend certainly isn't. And so... Um, Ben's, you know, I'm putting my life on hold to do this. And uh, so I go up there and, and I help my brother out and I do what I'm supposed to do. Uncommon sense will become a common sense. As I'm sitting in my little makeshift office that I rented in downtown Ben so I could get at least some work done while I'm helping put together a, uh, helping my brother legally with, with, uh, with his uh, defense and so forth. I end up putting together an investment bank out of Portland. Uh, one came available that was 40 years old, and it just like it fell into place, and it was perfect. I called the guy that owns the place. It's got a great reputation on Wall Street. And of all places, it's headquartered in Portland. And I called him up, and I said, 
He said, hey, well, I'm looking to put something together. You know, do you have an interest in doing something? He said, yeah. He goes, I'm retiring. And he goes, come over and see me. Within a couple of months, I take board control. My two partners and I take board control, equity control, spin the company off. And, and it's just like, I just created an investment bank out of Bend, Oregon. Why? Because not because I went to New York or Los Angeles where I should be creating investment banks, but because I followed an intuitive thought that made no sense and I still got exactly what I wanted to do. And that's the story of my sobriety. That's the story of my reliance on God. So I just want to say this in closing. A couple things. Alcoholics Anonymous is, to me, um, you know, there's a speaker that says that everything good and decent in his life is a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm just here to say that that's absolutely true for me. I'm not somebody that got my life back. I'm somebody that got a life by doing this. And... There's only been two things that have ever worked in my life. Ten, eight to ten drinks worked temporarily in my life. And a certain amount of actions in Alcoholics Anonymous, even though some of those actions sometimes seem to have no relevance to what my problem was, has worked. The difference is, is, this is these actions have led to a far richer, more robust life as a result. I am so grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous and... Uh, I'm just going to close with saying this, and that is, is that I have to, you know, I have a choice today. I can live a self-centered life and suffer the consequences, or I can live a God-centered life and suffer the consequences. My name is Chris. I'm an alcoholic. Thanks for my sobriety. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.